Oceans are to approve statutory rules relating to the health protection coronavirus restrictions regulations. There will be a single debate on both motions. I will ask the clerk to read the first motion, then call upon the minister to move it. The minister will then commence the debate on both motions. When all who wish to speak have done so, I shall put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record and I will call the minister to move it. The question will then be put on that motion. If that is clear, I shall proceed and ask the clerk to please read the first motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 5 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. Thank you. I call the Junior Minister Gordon Lyons to move the motion. I beg to move. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed there should be no time limit on this debate, and I call the Minister to open the motion on the debate. Thank you very much, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I welcome you back to your position, and it's good to see you uh, in better health again. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are two motions before the Assembly today, and with your permission, I will address both of these in my remarks. The pattern of these debates is now well known to members. We bring a motion regarding the relaxation of restrictions that have already been made, and members then studiously avoid discussing these amendments and instead talk about the further restrictions that they would like to see, or indeed any other COVID-related matter that they wish to discuss. Testing, yeah. testing in the meantime, testing in the meantime the patience of the uh, deputy speaker, and I don't expect today to be any different. Yeah. <laughs> But let me begin by outlining for members the changes brought about by these regulations and the reasoning behind the executive's decision making. Regulation 4 was amended to allow those who provide holiday accommodation, such as hotels, bed and breakfasts, apartments, campsites, caravan parks, and so on, to prepare for their reopening by taking advance bookings. While it's not subject to the motions under debate today, I am delighted that the executive moved quickly thereafter to give the hospitality sector specific dates when they, when they could reopen. Our caravan parks and camping sites opened last Friday, and our hotels and other holiday accommodations, as well as restaurants, bars and coffee shops and visitor attractions, will reopen later this week. I am sure that all members will agree that this is a positive step, especially at this time of year when everyone's minds turn to holidays and uh, for a sector that has been particularly hard hit by the lockdown. Regulation 4 has also been amended to allow places of worship and community centres to open to provide daycare for children. This relaxation allowed more parents and guardians and those providing childcare services to return to work, as well as improving the well-being of both parents and children and increasing a sense of normality. Mr Speaker, significant and important amendments have been made to Regulation 5, which is concerned with restrictions on movement. People who live alone have been able to form a small support unit with one other household, enabling the person to visit, stay over and spend more time with their support network. This is an important step to help tackle isolation. The housing market has also been opened up, allowing people to move house, to visit estate agents, view properties and make arrangements for removals. This relaxation removes the negative impacts on, on households in terms of physical and mental health from restricting house moves any longer than is absolutely necessary. People could also leave their homes to attend to the needs uh, or welfare of an animal or animals. Outdoor sports facilities uh, are now open and our elite, elite athletes can now resume their training as they prepare for major competitions and can use outdoor training facilities. Regulation 6 has been amended to allow marriages and civil partnerships to take place outdoors where the total number of people attending uh, is limited to 10. Members will agree that this uh, relaxation offers benefits in terms of personal well-being and we send our best wishes to those couples who are now able to undertake these celebrations. Regulation 6A was amended to allow outdoor gatherings of up to 10 people from different households, a uh, relaxation that offers benefits in terms of personal well-being. Changes were also made to Part 2, Schedule 2 of the regulations, which is concerned with those businesses that are subject to restriction or closure, to allow for non-food retail to reopen, initially limited to certain sections of the retail trade and subsequently updated to include all retail. These steps have brought about much needed recovery for the retail sector, which has been particularly affected by the COVID-19 crisis. It's good news. 
people can leave their homes to buy goods, improving personal well-being and increasing the sense of normality, as well as protecting the jobs of those who work in retail outlet, outlets and restoring people's livelihoods. A number of technical amendments were made to correct a drafting error in the amendment number three regulations, which came into operation at 11 p.m. on the 19th of May, which meant that it was not an offence to breach the restriction in regulation uh, 6A relating to outdoor gatherings of up to six people. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we have been clear all along that the executive will not be rushed into making decisions as a result of artificial deadlines. But equally, as I have already mentioned, we've moved quickly and decisively, uh, as circumstances allow, to bring about changes that help restore our economy and our society. The regulations have worked and continue to work. They have saved lives and they have prevented our health system from being overwhelmed. However, the pathway out of lockdown and towards recovery has not always been smooth. It is regrettable, but prob probably inevitable, that some inconsistencies have arisen when making such detailed regulations. And we have addressed these at the earliest opportunities, and indeed, we will continue to do so. Of course, not all changes have required new legislation, and we have striven to ensure that guidance is up to date and widely available to everyone. In recent days, that has included guidance to the many people in our community who have been shielding since mid-March, and those people can look forward to being able to meet up with others from the 6th of July and further relaxation of the shielding guidance after the 31st of July. Strong communications are vital so that the basis for our decisions are understood, sectors have time to prepare, and citizens can clearly understand what we are asking them to do. While the approach so far has not been to take decisions based on a timetable, we have recognised that some sectors benefit from indicative future dates. This means our decisions are taken on the basis that sectors and citizens will have the information they need, including some indicative dates, guidance where necessary, and strong messaging. Since the regulations um, that are subject to the motions being uh, debated today, the, the executive have agreed a number of further significant relaxations. Last week, we announced that indoor meetings of up to six people could take place within the home. We also agreed that places of worship could reopen from the 29th of June, and that hairdressers and barbers and other close contact activities can reopen from the 6th of July. And I know that many members are particularly pleased uh, to hear about that. Additionally, we have agreed a range of indicative reopening dates for a range of sectors and activities, including indoor gyms and sports courts. Not as much enthusiasm for those, I see, um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, libraries, playgrounds and open-air museums, and also a gradual return of spectators at outdoor events. These further indicative dates will allow the sectors involved to make their preparations for safely restarting and reopening. Another key tool is the Department of Health's Test, Trace and Protect strategy, which will continue to play a key role in, continuing, in, in containing transmission as more relaxations are introduced. And can I urge us all, if we are contacted by that service, uh, to play our part and to act on the information provided and self-isolate or get tested as appropriate. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I am pleased that we have been able to relax many of the restrictions that have had such a detrimental impact on the social and economic well-being of our citizens. However, the risk from COVID-19 remains, and it is still the case that citizen behaviour will determine outcomes in terms of transmission, morbidity and mortality. I'll give way to Mr. Alistair. Would the Minister agree that the Executive's credibility in making requirements of citizens, particularly about social distancing and numbers who can gather outside, is substantially undermined today by the fact that the Deputy First Minister and other members of this House are photographed and seen in 
flagrant breach, it would appear, of some of those regulations at the funeral of a terrorist, does that not undermine the status of what the executive requires of others? Well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I first of all want to note that there are many people um, across Northern Ireland that have had to forego family funerals. They have had to forego the traditional way in which they would grieve and mourn, and that has come at a personal cost uh, to, to many, many people. Therefore, I think it's essential, uh, and I haven't seen any of the, the footage that Mr. Alistair refers to, but I think it's absolutely essential that we all uh, provide leadership. Um, we are all subject to these regulations in the same way. We all have to ensure uh, that social distancing is adhered to and that the regulations are, are adhered to uh, as well. And that's particularly important for those of us uh, in leadership, and I would expect that um, of, of everybody. And there is uh, a requirement and a responsibility um, on us all to ensure that that uh, takes place. And it takes me back to what uh, I was saying. We are obviously um, moving further away uh, in terms of uh, enforcement. Um, with increasing relaxation of the regulations, citizen behaviour becomes increasingly a product uh, of choice. And in relaxing these restrictions, we have given citizens more freedom. And I urge members of the public to use this freedom sensibly because I do not want us to be in the situation that Leicester finds itself in today. We need to think of the health and well-being of each other and the huge societal and economic consequences of a return to lockdown. None of us want to see a second wave of this deadly virus. Therefore, we will be monitoring the impact of the relaxation of the regulations closely, and we are prepared to introduce restrictions if this is considered necessary to control the virus. So, Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, we now need to look beyond the response phase towards the actions that will be needed to ensure a robust uh, and sustainable recovery, rebuild public services, and restore more normal ways of living. And that process is underway with the executive, and we have started the development of a comprehensive recovery strategy. Citizens' issues are increasingly at the heart of the decisions we need to take now that the immediate crisis objectives are under control. That includes long-term health and economic and societal uh, well-being. And the fact that 95% of the population have avoided the disease is a double-edged sword. It means that 95% of the population potentially remains at risk, so the need for caution remains. And social distancing will remain a vital part of the response and recovery phases. The precise advice may change over time and must be well thought through and explained. As was announced last week, the executive agrees that two metres remains the optimum distance to maintaining physical distancing where possible. However, where appropriate mitigations can be made, a distance of no less than one metre between people should be adhered to. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I know that members will have additional qu questions uh, and comments on the points that I have made, uh, and I look forward uh, to them. Uh, however, for now, I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister. Given that it is 12.55 and the Business Committee has arranged to meet at 1pm today, I propose by leave of the Assembly to suspend this sitting until 2pm and the first item of, que of business when we return will be question time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is to return to the Health Protection Coronavirus uh, provisions. Uh, the Minister had delivered his address, and the next person to speak was the Chair of the TEO Committee, uh, Mr Colin McGrath. But if, I, if we take a few moments just to let members clear out um, and what have you. Okay, if we could just have a bit of order then. I call the Chair of the Executive Office Committee, Mr Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And it is, of course, the, all of the members that have left. It's their loss not to hear my remarks. Um, and I rise to speak on behalf of the committee 
uh, for the Executive Office. And further to the remarks from the Minister earlier, I indeed promise to remain talking only about the amendment that is presented here to us today. And I will give that pledge, um, of course, unlike himself, who went on to give us a whole list of all the other easements that have been made since, and it was great to hear of all of those that have taken place since. But I will stick uh, to discussing um, this uh, individual amendment, given that in some instances um, it was so badly handled. Um, as has always been the position, the committee welcomes the lifting of the restrictions when the time is right. All of us are acutely aware that the public eagerly awaits news uh, on what restrictions are being lifted and when they are being lifted. But with that news, there are questions flooding in from our constituents, um, questions that sometimes we can't at that stage answer. And I'm sure all members of this House now expect to receive calls as soon as announcements are made. When considering the last set of regulations, Amendment No. 4, the Committee noted the time difference between the date that they came into operation and the date that they were debated. Uh, they came in on the 21st of May, but were not debated until the 16th of June. So in between times, uh, there wasn't always a clarity on what was being lifted uh, in those restrictions and what that actually meant in practice. And in light of this, the committee has agreed uh, to write to the First and Deputy First Minister, and I make this suggestion here today to the Junior Minister, maybe to relay back to the Ministerial team, that potentially if amendments are being made, um, that immediately the Thursday afterwards, the Ad Hoc Committee should sit and give members the opportunity to seek the clarity on the questions that have been raised. Often the, uh, the announcements are made on a Monday and a Thursday uh, after the executive actually meets. But if we had an ad hoc meeting on that Thursday afternoon with a minister here, we could ask the questions that have been raised to us in the intervening time and allow us to give that direct clarity back to our constituents rather than having to write through ministerial offices or ask assembly questions. Um, and I think that that would be a very helpful approach for members and if it was possible to make that suggestion. The committee um, hasn't yet received a response to that suggestion, but it's hoped that it could be given uh, some serious consideration. I'd now like to make a number of points in my role as a SDLP MLA. And Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to reiterate the remarks made on behalf of the committee about the confusion that is in our communities about the decision that the executive is taking. They are now only loosely connected to the roadmap, and once again we are left with constituents scratching their head and wondering what the implications are for them. Um, to use terms such as close contact services, but not to detail what they are, is effectively as an announcement ver verging on useless, because we end up with people right across many different sectors contacting us to ask us, do we know, and we don't, and we have to try and search and find who is the relevant person within a department that can give us an answer. And often by the time we seek the answer, uh, somebody else has gone public with it, and we're then copying the information from news websites. And this typifies the announcements. They're sometimes a little bit scant on detail, plentiful in confusion, and with the timings and the briefings that are done behind the scene, they're almost pointless as announcements. And as I say, I think rather than taking them uh, as grandstanding at four o'clock upstairs in the Great Hall, it would be much better, and, and further to the remarks that you've made yourself, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that we could get some sort of update here in the House that we can actually interrogate and find out what is meant by them. Um, there has been much confusion about this amendment that was uh, taken as well and the process for it. The timing of the emergency addition of the powers to hand out fines, I think, was a little bit misjudged. To penalise people for gathering safely and within the guidelines as they saw it was possibly wrong. But it is not for this place to determine that, uh, and it's not for this place to determine whether that was appropriate. That is for the police and for other authorities. But if one was cynical, you could suggest that the part of issue fines was added in a rushed manner to enable uh, control of planned demonstrations that were taking place in the days after. But in the Health Committee, and I don't want to steal the thunder of the Chairman, uh, we asked specifically about that matter and we received assurances that they were not introduced quickly to hand out fines at those events. Um, so therefore, we'll take, I am quite happy to take people on their, their word as they've given that assurance to a committee. So to not support these amendments today would mean that the relaxations that were introduced would be overturned. 
Uh, and that would mean things like the weddings and civil ceremonies would be once again banned, and other restrictions such as the number of people who can gather in public places would be reduced. And I'm not sure that is what many grandparents who have been able to meet their grandchildren for the first time in months would want to see. I'm not sure it's what those who live alone and are at last able to get out and meet with small groups of friends uh, want to see. And I'm not sure it's what the public in general want to see. I support this amendment and the relaxations that are contained in it. But I hope that officials and the relevant ministers are aware of the impact that their oversights can cause and the negative impact that they can have on some of the community relations here in the north, and that they will exercise absolute care in the future to make sure that we don't see a repeat of this exercise. Thank you. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Health Committee, Mr Colin Gildernew. Um, I raised to update the House on the Health Committee's consideration of the, both of the statutory rules. The Chief Environmental Health Officer briefed the Health Committee on Amendment No. 5 to the regulations on the 18th of June. He reminded the Committee of the rolling requirement to review the regulations every 21 days and the requirement that restrictions be lifted as soon as they are not considered necessary, given the impact on many aspects of citizens' lives. He also reminded members of the process by which relaxations are developed by departments, brought to executive risk assessed and considered by the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer or Advisor before a decision is taken. It was noted that all the re related regulations have come via the urgent procedure under which they come into effect, but must be confirmed by the Assembly within 28 days. While this misses the important SL1 stage and the opportunity to influence policy that that provides, in urgent circumstances, it should allow the Committee to be briefed and look at their initial effect before coming to a view. The committee asked a series of questions around the laying of the regulations and the staggered commencement which resulted in enforcement provisions coming into effect on the day they were laid, whereas other provisions came into effect two days later. The Chief Environmental Officer advised that an omission in the enforcement provisions of a previous set of regulations, Amendment No. 3, was only noticed when finalising the enforcement provisions for Amendment No. 5. He said the opportunity was taken to correct the situation, as qu the, this omission, as quickly as possible. Asked about the urgency given the lapse of time since the original error, the CEO explained that the PSNA already assumed the missing enforcement provisions were in place as no one was aware of the omission. Concerns on the application of the enforcement provisions had been raised in a briefing by the Committee, by the, the committee on the Administration of Justice and Amnesty International. The briefing from them argued there was an inconsistent approach taken by the PSNA to issuing fines for participation in different protests in the days after the regulations came into effect. Particular concerns were expressed about penalties issued around the Black Lives Matter protest. The CEHO said the timing of the protests was coincidental, but acknowledged that, with hindsight, it would have been better to bring the correction into effect the following week. He stated that he could not respond to concerns around operational elements of police activity. The committee also asked the CEO about the distinction between a socially distanced protest and a queue such as those which we have all seen outside large retailers. He advised that the purpose of easements was to facilitate small groups of friends and family to gather outside and was not intended to cover large groups. Members inquired about public understanding of the regulations since they stipulate what is permissible. He acknowledged that in amending the original restrictions on activity by allowing for their reasonable excuses to leave home, the structure is now becoming unwieldy and may need to be reconsidered. Members discussed the matter at some length in terms of how best to address our concerns and recognised the distinction between the legitimate cause of the protest and the potential public health and enforcement issues arising from it, the way, from the way that it was organised and policed. There was further acknowledgement that COVID-19 itself has also negatively impacted on black and Asian minority ethnic communities. The committee agreed to support the regulations, but given the concerns outlined, we also agreed to write to the Justice Committee and to forward the briefing paper received from CAJ and Amnesty International in relation to this matter. The committee was further briefed on amendment number six on the 25th of June, and again, the CEHO outlined the main changes described by the junior minister. Having inquired about the impact of easements on the transmission rate or R number or other relevant metrics, 
The committee was assured that there is an ongoing downward trend across the various figures measured, and we welcome that. Members highlighted some apparent disparities emerging in the opening of certain types of business before others. The CEO acknowledged that given the current pace of change and the role of individual departments bringing forward proposals for easements, there was a need to address some inconsistencies and advised that work was ongoing to do so. Members also inquired when addiction support such as Alcoholics Anonymous or Gamblers Anonymous meetings could resume and were advised that consideration was being given to whether such meetings fell within an existing category of easement. Further questions were asked in relation to the safe operation of caravan parks and restaurants. Um, and the committee heard that the Department of the Economy was to produce further guidance for the hospitality sector. The CEO also confirmed that the guidance in question is non-binding, though open to legal challenge if felt to be incorrect. Members inquired about the speed with which revised guidance is made available to councils and were informed that it is available quickly on the department's website and sent immediately to heads of service for environmental health and councils. He also referred to previous committee requests and confirmed that this guidance is now available in several languages. The committee has also written to the department to seek further information on the scientific evidence on which these sets of amendments and other decisions are being based and on the type of data for sharing that is informing decisions in border areas. I think it's fair to say there remains a degree of concern around the potential impact of easing restrictions and the safeguards for those at greatest risk as lockdown eases. Reference was made to the Chief Scientific Advisor's comment that he is worried about low numbers of people in shops, etc., wearing face coverings. In terms of potential gaps to the amendments, the committee is also aware of a significant issue of partners not having been able to accompany women to antenatal appointments and into delivery and maternity wards. This has had a particular impact on women with health conditions, and there are important opportunities for bonding and attachment at these key moments of, of life. Members were advised the matter was under consideration and would not require a legislative amendment. The committee has written to the department to urge that consideration be given to this and to the matter of facilitating safe visiting at care homes. We actually also heard from the minister today and he has indicated to us that that hopefully will be an area that is progressed um, and, and I think we would be very welcome of that. Finally, as a committee, we explored the potential to reinstate the restrictions being relaxed should that prove necessary, and were advised that while there would not be a technical issue in doing so, the Department was very much aware of the challenge in asking the public to once again accept restrictions. The committee agreed to support the statutory rule. I'd just like to make a couple of brief remarks in relation to my role as, as Sinn Féin spokesperson for health, pre uh, last Kian Corlea. We have concerns with how amendment number 5 with regards to regulation 6a was introduced through a technical amendment on the 5th of June, the night before the, BL, the Black Lives Matter protests in Derry and Belfast. The, we need to clarify as to why this approach was taken, uh, as, as the, and the concern has been justifiably raised by the Committee for the Administration of Justice and Amnesty International. I raised the concerns, these concerns at the Health Committee as Chair, and we wrote to the Department of Justice regarding those, and we also forwarded to the Justice Minister the letter we received from CAJ. I do want to be clear, however, that the concerns raised relate to the mechan mechanism used, the, uh, the technical amendment, and the timing of that on the night before the protest, which introduced a breach of Regulation 6A as an offence within a number of hours, and gave people very little notice of when that would come into play. But the, the concern is not regarding the health protection amendments themselves. There have also been concerns raised re the policing of the protest, and Sinn Féin will scrutinise and hold the PSNA to account, as always, via the policing board. And I am aware also that the Ombudsman Office, I think, has launched an inquiry into that, uh, or an invest, uh, review into that as well. So, uh, Sinn I want to uh, support the regulations. I call Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And obviously, the retrospective nature of these debates somewhat limits the merits of discussing the changes referred to. It is clear, however, that the overwhelming public mood is one of welcoming of these of easing of the restrictions, as MLAs were lobbied by many seeking change that affects them, by businesses keen to get up and running again, and so on. So, good government is a responsive government, and I commend the executive for listening and acting accordingly. I think one of the most positive changes referred to here is the changes that allow uh, a return to wider and more normal family life. Allowing that single household to mix with another household was a very welcome move. So this has been a lonely time for so many, but not least for those who live alone. 
Likewise, the outdoor gathering restriction being eased to allow for groups of 10 to participate in outdoor gathering made a great difference to families and friendships. It's just a shame the weather didn't necessarily agree. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, one of the biggest challenges now is to get business moving again and to support our retailers, hospitality and tourism sectors and ensure they survive what has been a tsunami that has devastated many local businesses. I know from speaking to businesses in my own constituency of South Antrim that there is a steely determination to survive, to get things moving again. As consumers, we need to reward that determination with loyalty. Loyalty to the local clothes shop, to the family hardware store, to the coffee shop that offers the best local produce. Obviously, since these restrictions have been lifted, we have had considerable further progress on returning to some form of normality. And I want to pay tribute, especially to my colleague Dan Dodds, that's the economy minister, for driving forward with a Get Northern Ireland moving approach. And I know that is, that is greatly appreciated amongst the uh, business community. And I know Dan will not stop in terms of the support she gives local businesses in the days and weeks ahead. We must also work collaboratively, collaboratively with local councils to ensure that we work in tandem in delivering support, whether that be in easing outdoor trading rules or mentoring and advice. Uh, in conclusion, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I would urge the Executive to look at some of the outstanding issues that remain in terms of restrictions. And those looking forward to a wedding day need greater clarity on timescales for changes to rules. Again, we need that ramping up of our health service whether that be in terms of surgery outpatient appointments or the issue of attendance for both mothers and fathers and maternity appointments. And I do welcome actually the announcement that the Minister of Health has just made in terms of hospital visitation, care home visitation and uh, accompaniment to maternity appointments. That's very much welcome. Um, also, uh, I want to encourage office workers to return to their place of work. The shutters down on many high streets are the non-retail, but the imagery is one of a closed town centre. So we need these workers back into the office as soon as possible to help support our high streets. And the same very much applies to the public sector workers. There should not be no hierarchy in terms of how workers are treated. It is vital that we stay safe, stay, save lives, work safe and save lives. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the regulations as amended, as I've said before in this chamber, um, but want it to be recorded again. I do so with some discomfort. I, like many others, look forward to the time when we no longer have to amend the health protection regulations and that life for our people has returned to normal. If I could place on record, therefore, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, my concern that announcements around raising of restrictions and amendments to guidance seem to take place in the media before meetings of this Assembly, in particular the Health Committee. As the threat of the pandemic dissipates, we should be given sufficient opportunity to scrutinise and engage around these proposed amendments to such important and far-reaching um, issues to our um, constituents. Moving on, it remains vital that we do not forget those who are clinically vulnerable or those who are caring for them. The proposed reopenings announced last week were good news for many people across the community. Um, there was certainly something for everyone, but we must remember that those shielding must remain so until 31st of July and cannot, as it stands, take advantage of most of the openings. We, we will need to consider how we ensure that not just that they do not feel pressurised into taking risks, that they're not comfortable with, but we provide them with support to access public services going forward. On top of this, I remain concerned by the absence of reliable data on which to base our decisions on easing lockdown. I did receive a very useful document from the department on how it is calculating and using the R number, and I'm content that the reopenings still take place over a period of weeks so that we can assess the latest recorded infection rates and ensure as far as reasonably possible that what we are doing is not leading to a rise in cases. Yet we are still told that we are being guided by the science. That means we need to know what scientific guidance was sought and what scientific guidance was presented. This is particularly important because if we need to manage any future outbreaks, as we've seen in Leicester today, we will need public support to do so. Um, over the next few months. Um, the more information we can provide the public, the better. So I do have some concerns that we are not addressing with precision the lessons learned elsewhere. Risks from the virus are clearly determined by the environment. Indoor facilities with poor ventilation are particularly at risk. I'm concerned, therefore, that we have opened up and are opening up 
um, faster indoors, in particular um, certain types of indoor locations sooner than we should. I would like to see the scientific evidence on which these decisions are based to provide some reassurance. I am also a little concerned that openings are announced without full and appropriate guidance. I think as um, Mr McGrath mentioned there, or without the guidance being in place for people, whether they are business, service providers, potential customers or whoever, to enable them to fully prepare. This often causes practical confusion but also serious concerns about safety. For example, what exactly are mitigations allowing one metre distancing? Why were they not clearly stated at the time the change was announced? This again reduces confidence that decisions are being led by a scientific guidance and genuine public health considerations. Therefore, addressing the regulations in general as they are being amended, I remain concerned that some people are being left out from due consideration. And I note that the longer we go without seeing the scientific guidance and public health considerations upon which these decisions are based, the less the public will have confidence in them. It is therefore essential that decisions are not just announced, but also explained. I would like to put again on record my thanks to the public for their consideration during these difficult few months. There remain significant challenges ahead, and I would emphasise again that despite the very low levels of tr transmission, we need to be cautious and we need to maintain the basics, not least hand hygiene, but appropriate distancing and ensuring that our, guide, our gatherings are of uh, appropriate size. Thank you. Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, I rise to support this uh, relaxation uh, in front of us today. And I also welcome other relaxations that are coming down the line. Always with the caveat, of course, that they are based purely on scientific and medical advice. The health minister today addressed the health committee and you will have heard him uh, in this chamber over recent weeks uh, refusing to be drawn into making any comparisons with other parts or other regions of the United Kingdom or, or the Republic of Ireland. But today that he said that he felt that he had to say that we are probably the best placed of all the areas of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland in terms of, of uh, transmission rates, etc. And I think that that's down to this emergency legislation that, that we've all had to operate on uh, under recent months. And it's down to the fact that the people of Northern Ireland have cooperated fully uh, with, the, uh, with, with the regulations. There have been people who have foolishly decided to breach and break the regulations, but thankfully, they are in a minority. Now, the Chief Environmental Officer, who uh, the Chair of the Health Committee alluded to, who had given the Health Committee a briefing back in, uh, earlier this month, um, he admitted, openly admitted uh, that there had been an error in the wording of, of a, the regulation, the enforcement part of it. And bearing in mind that this is an emergency situation. The regulations are all emergency legislation, as are the relaxations. And you have to accept, in a situation where we're making law and we haven't got the benefit of the normal levels of scrutiny that law takes uh, to be put into force, I think we have to accept that from time to time, human error will play a part and unfortunately, on this occasion, human error did play a part. He also admitted that when the legislation was changed, I think it might have been on a Friday, he said that he wasn't aware, and I take him totally at face value, he wasn't aware that there was a protest planned for uh, the next day. He also did say, as the chair spoke, that and with hindsight, it might have been better to delay uh, that part of the legislation for one week. But equally as well, and I say this from a position, I've said it in the Health Committee and I repeat it today on the record, I fully and totally support the motivation behind 
the Black Lives Matter protests. As long as everything is done peacefully, we've seen in some parts of the world where it hasn't been done peacefully, you cannot support that. But I totally support the motivation uh, behind it. And I would say to the organisers of it that perhaps it was ill-advised to call a large public gathering in the middle of this pandemic. I think it was ill-advised, and perhaps they, with hindsight, uh, would say that perhaps it might have been better not to have called so many people out onto the street. I know there was a lot of talk uh, in the Health Committee about conspiracies and all the rest of it. I don't think there was no, there was no conspiracy. There was no conspiracy. It was a matter of human error that caused the, uh, the, the legislation to have to, be, uh, to have to be revisited and changed. I would just say, um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that a lot of people in Northern Ireland have made huge sacrifices. People have cancelled weddings. People have lost a lot of money through lost deposits and everything else. Uh, people have been heartbroken about that. But the biggest sacrifice in Northern Ireland has been around funerals of loved ones. And we know what the psyche is in Northern Ireland and how much uh, weight we attach to, to the wake and, uh, and everything that, that goes with it. And just uh, the other day, I watched a, a hearse stop not far from my home in the middle of the road and a wife uh, going over to the hearse, kissing the side of the hearse to say goodbye to her husband of 60 years who was in a coffin in that hearse on its way to the crematorium and she wasn't permitted to travel to the crematorium with her, her husband. She had to say her goodbyes in the middle of a public street in front of the public one of the most personal things that any of us would ever have to do to say goodbye to a loved one. So people have made huge sacrifices and I do believe that to go back to that protest that day and any other protest the following week or any other protest, I think they're ill advised and I think they do fly in the face of people like that woman that I've just described. How does she feel? when she sees large gatherings of people, and we've seen it again today in Belfast. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Thank you. I call Mr. Matthew O'Toole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we are again today debating retrospective changes to the coronavirus regulations, regulations that we all, I think, agree um, uh, were necessary, restrictions on our liberty um, uh, that um, uh, have been restricted in order to um, uh, protect the public. And as others have said, in Northern Ireland we have been, um, notwithstanding the immense grief and sorrow caused by um, several hundred deaths, we have um, uh, perhaps uh, succeeded uh, at, in terms of restricting um, the rate of infection and also um, uh, controlling the virus. So people who have made immense sacrifices, as Alan Chambers just said, can, be, um, can take heart from that. Um, as I said, we are debating again today retrospective changes to the coronavirus regulations. That's a frustrating part of the way we've done this process over the last few months. I understand the reason for it, but it's still frustrating. Um, you know, I suppose just up front I would say I will be supporting the, the, the retrospective regulation change in, in a sense it would be odd not to given that they've already happened, though I share the concerns some have raised around how the, the, the um, regulation change came in quite late before a, the, the Black Lives Matter the Black Lives Matter prote protest. And in, indeed, I raised the issue um, several weeks ago with the Justice Minister, but, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, Given the strangeness of having to debate retrospective regulations, and with your indulgence, I'd like to reflect on something else, if another forward-looking uh, regulation change that's happening, and that's something that's happening this Friday. This Friday in Northern Ireland, pubs are opening. Pubs which serve food inside uh, will be opening to members of the public. That was announced 
um, recently by the executive. Um, the executive have made much correctly of the need to, um, given, we ha given the low infection rate in Northern Ireland and given the extreme level of sacrifice and the economic cost, it's right that those restrictions don't re remain in place any longer than they have to. So the decision was made to open pubs in Northern Ireland. Let me say up front, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I grew up working in pubs. I care a huge amount about our pub and hospitality sector. Um, I think, in fact, that they're enormously important, not just to our sort of cultural lineage on this island, but to our tourism offer and to how we do uh, community life. I think we should invest more um, in our pubs. But I am very concerned about the fact that the executive has chosen, in a completely unforced and slightly inexplicable way, to open pubs on a Friday. Why? In the Republic of Ireland, pubs opened yesterday. That's a Monday. Next Monday in Scotland, pubs will open. They'll open in a controlled way, serving food. Um, people may have seen some of the Im images that came out of um, pubs that serve food in Dublin and other parts of the south yesterday. People were socially distanced. It was planned. Um, lots of it were older, retired people who were able to go in at lunchtime, have a quick drink, perhaps have a bite to eat. And it, was, and it happened in an ordered, planned way. It gave the staff the opportunity to deal with this immense and enormous change um, on a Monday afternoon when things are naturally quieter. But in Northern Ireland, we have made what is to me the bizarre and inexplicable decision to open pubs on a Friday in midsummer after a payday, after three and a half months of being closed. Pub staff are going to have to deal with, uh, I, 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 I hate to call it a black eyed Friday, but I don't know what it will be. I, I don't like to predict. Um, I don't like to predict things that, we don't want, that uh, none of us want to happen, but I have grave concerns about unintended consequences from what seems like a very unthought through decision. I'd love the Minister to be able to give us some indication as to why the executive didn't simply say the pubs can open in a socially distanced and planned way, for example, yesterday or next Monday or even today, so that publicans who want to do the right thing, and I support publicans and I support the sector, and I think it's right that pubs open, why not give publicans several days to get their premises ready, to get their staff used to the principle of social distancing, and to get themselves in a place where they can, when they can do this properly? Instead, we have taken the slightly surreal and, I'm afraid, risky decision to open pubs on a Friday in midsummer. Earlier on, the junior minister said correctly that the risk from COVID-19 remains, and he was right. He said the risk. Um, the risk remained in our community. We know what's happened in Leicester. We know um, that this virus is nowhere near going away. But it's also true, as he has said and other ministers have said, that part of what we need to do now is give businesses, workers and us as individuals in society the tools that we need to manage the risk properly. Given that we have achieved in Northern Ireland um, and across this island a lower rate of infection uh, than was the case several weeks ago. However, it's the job of this executive, and it has patted itself on the back enough, it's the job of this executive to give the public the best possible framework for managing this risk. And I'm afraid, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that opening the pubs in the height of midsummer, after a payday, without any preparation is a daft and inexplicable thing to do. I make much uh, of my experience at work in government. Well, I worked for many years in pubs in Downpatrick and elsewhere. And I wouldn't want to be having to deal with, uh, with, with a pub reopening on, Friday, with, on a Friday for the first time in several months. So I would just ask the Minister to reflect on that. I hope I'm happy to give way to... Thank the member for giving way. Would the member agree with me that it is absolutely crucial that staff safety is at the heart of reopening of the pub and hospitality sector? And it was a missed opportunity not to have the voice of staff heard on the reopening of this before this Friday. And also agree with me that no jobs should be lost in this sector after its reopening. I completely agree, and I know, um, and I know the member has, has, like myself, even more recent, of the ho more recent experience of the hospitality sector. Let me, so let me just, re I just want to conclude by saying, I really want this to get this right. Like lots of people, I want to um, enjoy some safe socialising this summer. I want the pub industry to, to get back uh, on its feet. I would have loved, frankly, them to get back safely yesterday or today. It would have been safer. I just think it's a bizarre decision in the middle of summer to open pubs up on a Friday, and perhaps the Minister could offer some clarity as to why, uh, why that's happening. Thanks very much. I call Ms Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And like others, I'll be commenting on the discussion that we're having on the retrospective relaxation of regulations stemming from announcement made some weeks ago. 
um, as with the opening up of certain types of retailers and amendments five and six also allowing elite athletes to restart training and for certain groups of workers to access childcare, which has now obviously been circumvented by further announcements made by the executive last week. But there are clear issues around the restrictions on gatherings and enforcement powers that need addressed. The executive seemed to me to be picking and choosing what restrictions to lift from the menu of options laid out in their plan, and the announcements made so far I find hard to correlate with the five-step approach, which raises questions as to how they use scientific and medical evidence to come up with this plan, and also how they are using it to make decisions as we speak, given that we don't have the evidence to look at. The manner in which these amendments are made clearly show that the five stages of the plan haven't been followed in a linear way, and recovery plan is not joined up. It would seem to me that though some of the most important issues like childcare and worker safety are being treated as an afterthought following relaxations on restrictions on workplaces. The approach that the executive is taking of picking and choosing what to do next is resulting in more questions than answers and sowing confusion amongst those seeking clarity on their circumstances on what they should do next after each announcement. And instead of pandering to those who ever shouts the loudest, we need a strategic, coherent approach that takes into account the cross-cutting nature of measures to reopen our economy and support our families. A strategy for childcare and schools, comprehensive workplace guidance and support mechanisms should all be in place before we expect people to fully return to work, not thrown together afterwards. The guidance that's being issued should be sector specific and actually work for people who work in that industry. And I know that my inbox has been filling up with emails from business owners who are not only confused by the guidance and its lack of detail, but also reading pages and pages of words that do not apply to them. Indeed, like my colleague who spoke on the reopening of pubs earlier on, and I too, I want to mention the hospitality sector and the guidance specifically, and one that I have spoken on many times before, and of course would declare my interest as a temporary part-time member of staff in one currently. The guidance issued to hospitality had a section in it about the use of PPE in hospitals. That does not apply to pubs. And I also just want to reiterate about how difficult this is going to be for pub staff, most of whom are on minimum wage and some of the most insecure employment in our economy will have to deal with crowds on a Friday with no security, with guidance that is completely up in the air and been left each individual owner and manager to do themselves. And they have nowhere to go to actually get clarity from the executive. So they come to the likes of myself and many other MLAs in this chamber. And that's not good enough because this is, folks, we're talking about staff safety here. Many people that I have spoken to are literally freaking out because they are going to catch coronavirus by the end of the summer if we are not careful. And they are not given the guidance and the detail that they need. So we are effectively just letting them go out. Public, are going to, public and customers are going to come in. We have to take customers and the public's you know, guidance that they're maybe they're in a bubble or that they're in the same household. We don't know what's going to happen when there's a few pints in. We really have to think about this, and it's something that I would love to have a conversation. If anybody wants to have a conversation about the realities of working in this sector at the moment, please come and speak to me. My door is open. I will. I remember agree with myself from my remarks earlier that this is the very purpose that having a few days after the announcement is made an opportunity in this House to be able to question ministers rather than what we've had to do, have a couple of weeks of speculation, then we get four weeks later, uh, the, the, the amendments are led here, then we have to get the clarification at this stage. Wouldn't it be good if we could get um, such clarification a few days later? I thank the member for his intervention. I would completely agree with him. I heard his comment earlier on and I could not agree more. That's what the ad hoc committee should be for and it should be used on a weekly basis um, by um, any number of ministers. And I'd be happy to sit here listening and being able to question on every single question that I get through my inbox and my phone. But we, have, we really do have to think about this. Business owners and employers are really, they are doing their best. Some of them are doing a lot more than others. And we really, really need to have an opportunity and an open line of communication to get actual answers for business owners because this is staff and customer safety. This is not about the economy. This is about health of people. So the basics need to be covered and people need to be given assurance that what steps they do take are the right ones, not only for their customers, but importantly for their staff safety. As I've said, it should not be a copy and paste job. The guidance must be issued in conjunction fully with sectors and with the very staff that they affect. So in speaking on these regulations today, every time guidance is issued following an announcement, many more questions need answered and people are being left in the dark. And ministers must consider this properly and give this much needed clarity as this is fundamentally what is missing. 
We've had situations reported to us that business owners are getting mixed messages from different advice and different advice depending on what MLA or MP's office they contact or what council area you live in. It creates confusion and it does not bode well for the certainty that is needed for people in order to reopen safely. We do have an issue with the restrictions on gatherings and protests as well, and I think everybody here can agree that there have been more difficulties in enforcement than are needed. There have been examples of how the gaps are now being tested and major holes have been identified and the enforcement of them not being equal across the board. We've had scenarios where fines have been issued, others where they have not been, protests and gatherings clamped down on and others let go. As appointed out by Amnesty International and the Committee on the Administration of Justice, these regulations do not address the right to protest alongside the need to protect public health. The lack of clarity has led to the police using Regulation 6A in the context of protests, fuelled by the inconsistencies that we have all witnessed. Ministers need to urgently address these issues around enforcement, and I would hope the junior minister can take this back to get actual details for the Chamber on. To quote Amnesty, I fully agree that the right to protest is a fundamental human right, which may be limited in a public health emergency, but limitations must be proportionate to meet the test of legal certainty. This is, the rules must be clear and not enforced in an arbitrary or discriminatory manner. If the executive decisions on relaxation of the regulations are informed by the scientific and, uh, scientific and, medi scientific and medical evidence, then the executive should publish that advice. Every announcement should carefully consider all those that it may affect, the necessary given, the detail given, otherwise it opens up wider questions and it does not bode well for public confidence at a time where it is needed the most. I call Mr Cherry. Carol. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, and it's good to see you back and I wish you uh, good health for, for the period ahead. Uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, it's a damning indictment of the political esta establishment and indeed the PSNI's approach that throughout this crisis, a health pandemic during which workers' safety has been risked by large employers and some of the most vulnerable have essentially been left to fend for themselves in current home conditions, which should at the very least be the subject of a public inquiry. It's a damning indictment that the only section of our society that have been specifically targeted with a large number of fines, cautions and threats of prosecution seems to have been Black Lives Matter protests, protesters who were uh, taking part in safe and socially distant uh, events. Mr Speaker, I want to say that this issue should be treated with the utmost severity by all in this chamber, because if ratified here today, it will send a crystal clear message that this Assembly supports discriminatory punishment for anti-racist protesters. And I want to lay out in no uncertain terms why that, uh, that is the case. We have been asked to support two amendments, Amendment 5 and Amendment 6. Amendment 6, as we have heard already, allows for lifting restrictions on workplaces such as non-essential retail, and allowing people to gather uh, in their hundreds at queues at IKEA and other shops, which, given that they are number, at least last week, uh, was still close to one, and we have little of a test and trace system to speak of, could potentially risk the health and safety of workers, see them taken off furlough and put them back to work before we can abs be absolutely sure that it is safe. At the very same time, the very same executive is asking us to pass Amendment 5, which was used by the PSNI to fine and threaten BAME protesters for taking a safe stand against racism. You don't need a fine tooth comb to find the glaring hypocrisy here. Indeed, despite warnings from various medical experts, virologists, workers and trade unions about rushing to reopen the economy, we heard some already, the executive seemed intent on ploughing ahead. Those in the hospitality sector in particular, as we've heard, have been very clear that they do not believe that there's a means uh, for them to socially distance in their workplace. And what is the response of the executive? Close the ears. The creation of a recovery panel without one trade unionist on it. And a Boris Johnson-esque approach which puts profit over the health of our communities. But when it comes to the kind of gatherings which uh, don't make profit, which are entirely socially distant, as was the case on the June 6 uh, Black Lives Matter protesters gathered in solidarity, uh, those who were fed up with systemic racism, this executive takes the exactly opposite approach by doling out special police powers um, to facilitate repression 
and discrimination, and by giving the PSNI political cover to carry out that repression. Anyone listening to press statements and interviews by Arnie Foster, Michelle O'Neill and Naomi Long in the run-up to the Black Lives Matter uh, protests could see that political cover was being given to police actions. And the Justice Minister's comments uh, almost immediately after the protests that police actions were proportionate were pr particularly disgraceful, in my opinion. Uh, they were out of touch with reality and a dangerous intervention in support of the police actions, which are now being widely described as discriminatory. Uh, and one week later, another crowd uh, gathered uh, in response to the Black Lives Matter movement. It should be remembered, uh, attended by elements of the far right who have threatened the presence of black people, minorities and refugees on our streets. Not a single fine was handed out on this occasion, despite the fact that there was clearly no attempt even uh, at trying, uh, never mind implementing social distancing. So I would challenge the Minister in his response uh, to tell me how he can comfortably uh, claim that this is not discriminatory policing. I challenge the Justice Minister to take action on this disparity as well, in a manner she has thus far refused to do. If she is able to intervene to comment on the fines for Black Lives Matter protests, then there is no good reason why she cannot highlight the blatantly inconsistent approach uh, and work to make sure it does not happen again while she holds the Justice Ministry. It should be pointed out that other gatherings, not of a political nature, were also allowed uh, to proceed unchallenged, shop queues being the most highly covered. Uh, one has to ask if the Black Lives Matter protesters were holding their placards and chatting outside IKEA or Tesco's, or they were in swimsuits at a crowded breach, uh, they might have been uh, met with an entirely different fate. That incredibly seems to be the case, and how can anyone here sit comfortably with that? Life according to Stormont, Mr Deputy Speaker, as we are being asked to approve it today, is one where shops should open, bars should open, hairdressers and more should open in order to facilitate the executive's rush to kickstart the economy, even if workers in, it, uh, in, that field, in those fields do not feel safe. Rather than taking steps to consider an entirely different kind of economic model, which is not entirely uh, predicated uh, on profits. But if those same workers, Mr Deputy Speaker, are decided to engage in safe, socially distant, anti-racist protests, they will have the book thrown at them. It is frankly disgusting. And parties, in my view, shouldn't support it today, and especially those MLAs and parties sitting here today who claim to be opponents of state repression but will likely endorse this dangerous farce. As has been recognised by human rights organisations such as Amnesty International and the Community for the Administration of Justice, the treatment of BA BAME and other protesters was disproportionate. Uh, the Stormont handed down these powers without a democratic vote at the final hour on Friday the 5th of June makes this situation all the more insidious. Who can say that does not seem targeted? It seems entirely contrived to me in order to uh, police BAME protests the very next day. And imagine the gall uh, uh, it must take for some in this chamber to claim that, uh, that it was just a coincidence. We see you, and those protesters see you and your comments. Every anti-racist in the North uh, sees through that uh, attempt to whitewash this issue. Today, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm asking everybody who is uncomfortable uh, with last-minute, seemingly contrived acts of discrimination against anti-racists and the BAME community to oppose Amendment 5. To those who say it must pass because there are elements in it which are good um, and which don't relate to the policing of the protest, I say do not use this pathetic excuse. It was entirely within the gift of this executive to not move this amendment today and to bring only the elements which do not relate to the police and the protests just as swiftly as they were able to force this amendment through in the first place. If they could do it at half five on a Friday evening, they can sure as hell bring it for ratification on a different day amended. We live in a society, Mr Deputy Speaker, that does have a clear race problem, a society with a deeply disturbing level of racist incidents and with appalling treatment of refugees and asylum seekers. At times, we have had more incidences of racism than sectarianism, yet 86.5% of racially motivated hate crimes go unsolved. What a startling figure. 50 per cent less than any other hate crime. A 13.5 success rate is a failure uh, that has put the lives of many people uh, at risk. Some 79 per cent of asylum seekers recently reported they are unable to afford enough food. 71 per cent of asylum seekers who are parents here reported being unable to afford school uniforms for their children. 
These are just some of the figures, Mr Deputy Speaker, that highlight the problem we face in society. The broader point is attempts to address these policy gaps have been stalled uh, by su subsequent executives for over a decade. There is clearly an institutional problem here, right at the heart of government, from the top of the executive right down to the PSNI on the streets and their response to these protests. Instead of tackling these problems of institutional racism, this Assembly is potentially adding to it by rubber stamping legislation that was used to unfairly target BAME uh, and anti racist protesters. No other group of society has had these penalties imposed on them, despite organising public gatherings. So I am appealing, Mr Deputy Speaker, to all parties and calling on MLAs to reject Amendment 5 and to stand in solidarity with those unfairly penalised during the socially distant Black Lives Matter protests. Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call the next speaker, uh, the minister, when she was entering the chamber, walked in front of him while he was speaking. And that's not that's considered a discourtesy, and I'm sure she didn't mean one. But I don't think I think we've all been most of us in this room have been here long enough. So I just I call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. It's good to see you fit and well and back in your post. Uh, I'll try to say nothing that would upset uh, your recovery. <laughs> um, Withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, today there's something of a pall of hypocrisy that hangs over this executive in terms of its COVID regulations. For months now, on an eye daily basis, up in the Long Gallery, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister and or substitutes, have lectured the people of Northern Ireland about the inescapable necessity of standing in favour of and implementing each and every one of these regulations. We are all in it together, we were told. And when families found it very, very difficult in burying their loved ones to abide by these regulations, the Deputy First Minister went on record to say that no one was above the law. Well, today, we saw that she herself thinks she is above the law, that the finance minister thinks he is above the law, that other Sinn Féin assembly members think they are above the law. The credibility of this executive on these issues has been shredded by, the, by a joint leader of this executive this very day. What a commentary that as we meet to debate restrictions such as this, that the joint leader of this government is out on the streets in West Belfast flagrantly breaching the very regulations which she put in place. Point of order, Mr O'Dowd. Uh, Mr Allister may have a view on whether breaches occur today or not, but it is not appropriate for a member to stand up in this House and accuse another member or a minister of breaking the law. It is not appropriate. I don't believe it would stand under standing orders. I think the best I could say, and I'm oh, sorry, I have to rise to answer that. I think the best I could say in relation to that is that the standing orders and the rules and conventions of the House instruct members to be temperate at all times in what they say and in how they say it. Um, I think, Mr. O'Dowd, you have put your comment on the record. I think, Mr. Allister, you have put your comment on the record as well, and I'll allow you to resume. Thank you. Well, 
I'll express it in the very terms that the executive expresses the rules about funerals on NI Direct. This is the guidance of Michelle O'Neill. This is the guidance she has lectured us all about in this building. And this is what it says. The funeral should be private and only the following should be there. Up to a maximum of 30 people. Let's bring it right up to date. Up to a maximum of 30 people. This figure does not include funeral directors or other people needed to officiate. There it is. That's what Michelle O'Neill tells the rest of us across Northern Ireland. And when it comes to the most difficult issue of all funerals, they should be private and up to a maximum of 30 people should be there. And yet today, in fragrant defiance of her own guidance, she takes herself as a joint leader of this government to West Belfast to breach the very guidance she puts upon the rest of us. That is why I say this executive today has shredded its own guidance. This executive today has lost all credibility when it comes to saying to ordinary people, do what we say. Not do what we do, do what we say. And that is the inescapable, orchestrated, predetermined message from Sinn Féin and their leadership today. It's not do as we do, it's do as we say. That is contemptible. Utterly contemptible. And that junior minister, of course, has to come today and tell us why these regulations are so essential to us. I notice he's getting no help from Minister Kearney. He's not here today to answer this debate. Is it embarrassment keeps him away? Is he running away from the questions as to why his leaders were in flagrant breach of the regulations today? Is that why it's been left to Minister Lyons to handle this alone? It really is an appalling indictment of not just the dysfunctionalism, but the double standards of this miserable executive. That they say to ordinary folk in the depths of grief and sorrow and despair, you cannot go to your friend's funeral. You cannot be there. As Mr. Chambers told us, even a widow can't go to the crematorium. Michelle O'Neill and the rest of them can go in the throngs unlimited to the funeral of a terrorist. That's a commentary in itself on this government and its regulations. So, Deputy Speaker, I want to turn to some of the specifics of Amendments 5 and 6. I want to deal specifically and primarily with the issue of marriage. Amendment 5 introduced a revision of Regulation 4. Regulation 4, you will recall, was do's and don'ts about what must be open and what must be closed. And it deals at paragraph 6 with places of worship. 
And Regulation Amendment 5 put in to Regulation 4.6 this subparagraph. A place of worship may be used to solemnize a marriage ceremony subject to, one, the ceremony taking place outdoors, and two, a total number of 10 persons, and that I don't think will be affected by the 30 provision, a total number of 10 persons being present in the place of worship. Now, what does that mean? It says, solemnize a marriage cer ceremony subject to the ceremony taking place outdoors and a total number of 10 persons being present in the place of worship. Not at the place of worship. In the place of worship. What does that mean? Now we've been told in guidance and everything else, you can only have outdoor weddings. Fair weather weddings, I've called them before. And that in itself is a burden too far. I do not see any logical, compelling reason for this provision that weddings can only be outdoors. Yes, I understand a limitation on numbers. But when I look at regulations that say a place of worship can be used for funerals, Inside, be used to broadcast from, and now under Amendment 6, can be used to provide childcare, but can't be used for a wedding. We have reached an utterly illogical position. You can use a church for funeral. You can now go to it for community worship, for an act of worship. You can now use it for childcare, but you can't get married in it. That act of worship is excluded. I do say to the junior minister, the executive needs to urgently address the glaring, glaring inconsistencies in these regulations. They need, what have they got against marriage? What is it about marriage that you can't be married in church? There's no justifiable shadow of a reason why that should be. You can now have religious services, Bible readings, all of that. No limitation on the numbers, but the one thing you can't do is get married. You can have your kids minded in childcare, but you can't get married. That's absurd. And it's the absurdity of that which brings regulations such as this into disrepute. But it is as nothing over the self inflicted disrepute into which these regulations have been brought today by the Deputy First Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alistair. The final speaker on the list is Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and good to see you back in your role and hopefully fully recovered from uh, your recent uh, illness. Uh, I think, from, from, from a, a societal point of view, there is considerable confusion in relation to how this entire process has been handled. Because at the outset, when COVID was coming towards us and we could watch the impact it was having right across the globe. Uh, we, instead of preparing, were uh, doing very little and then there was an automatic panic reaction to closing everything or in some cases a debate about closing everything. You're freezing to do so and then uh, coming back later that day to this chamber in the case of the Education Minister and then announcing the closure of schools, for example. It just seems that this entire uh, process around uh, COVID-19 and the 
pre preparation for to ensure the health and safety of the general populace has been very badly handled, very messily handled. But I, like other members of this House, appreciate that it's an entirely very complicated, unprecedented situation. But at, at, the, at, the, at the earliest stage, it was close everything, shut everything down, shut your businesses. And I think it's important to recognise the huge sacrifice that has been made by all sectors of our society uh, and even in uh, uh, the business community who have been closed and their doors have been shut for many months, but also in relation to our health care staff, our nurses and doctors who for uh, the last number of months and our frontline workers who have sacrificed their lives, their well-being to ensure that our society, that we were safe and cared for and looked after within hospitals. The sacrifices were huge so huge that we will never, ever be truly able to thank those who have stepped beyond all boundaries to help and protect our population from the threat and risk of COVID-19. My concern, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, is that as we emerge from COVID-19, and we still remain in a significant place of uncertainty, of what the true impact potentially could be ahead. We are simply now, instead of following a phased reopening, announcing in a lucky dip sort of approach, the reopening of this, that, and everything that may suit the agenda of particular ministers or the first and deputy first minister at the executive. It's unhelpful in many ways because whilst we're minded to continually think of those who have made considerable sacrifices throughout this pandemic. A reckless reopening, a loose reopening, a lack of guidance around what is expected in relation to the reopening of our society across all sectors. If not handled properly, we will remain, or sorry, return to square one. And we are seeing patterns emerge right across the globe in various countries where there are spikes happening in relation to this pandemic and where we're seeing that people are being, uh, that infection rates are going up in various towns, villages and so on and so forth. Our society are concerned and rightly so. And they have put their trust and faith in us as legislators and in the executive to ensure that whatever action we take ensures the safety of the population. But over the course of the last number of weeks, many members in this House will know we have been inundated with constituents asking us to clarify the guidance or the announcement that has been made here. Even by example, at an early stage, one of the most earliest announcements was in relation to hotels. You know, they could book a hotel, but we couldn't tell you the date. That's just an example of some of the inconsistencies and shortcomings around proper planning of reopening our society. The, the public out there are concerned, and they're reaching out to us as individual MLAs and as uh, people in positions of authority to ensure that whatever steps we take, at all times we can ensure that the public will be safe. But when each and every week we're hearing announcements of the reopening of, be it churches, as Mr. Alistair said, and you're hearing that um, there can be funerals for a certain amount of people present, uh, there can be masses or church services, but you can't have weddings. It, it doesn't make sense. So it causes a confusion in our communities that we then are burdened with trying to clarify and then we're in the ridiculous position as legislators and we can't even clarify it because of such poor communication in relation to the announcement. The phased approach that I understood, now we have to remember, throughout this entire pandemic, whilst we were ensuring, thank God, in an operational assembly, that people were safe and regulations were in place and that measures were in place to support businesses and our community, and also support our health care and frontline workers as well. We should have also been planning 
properly from day one for the reopening of our society. The flick of the switch approach doesn't work because it puts everybody at risk. And I don't think any member of this House would argue with that. If we get this wrong and we reopen society very quickly without proper protections, guidance or other ways in place, then we are putting people at risk. And I think that uh, that would be an unforgivable situation for this House. If you consider, we talked about funerals today, and I'm not going to make political points, but I will point out a very uh, glaring frustration that I had today. That we've lost John Dallet in more recent months, a man that has been a political, public representative for 40 years. The SDLP, my colleagues, couldn't attend his funeral because we respected the regulations in place to ensure the safety of the population, but also, more importantly, to show leadership that it was wrong to go down there and put others and ourselves at risk. So we're expected to show leadership, folks. And across this House, it's very frustrating that certain parties are doing one thing on the pulpit on a Monday and doing something entirely different by the Tuesday. It damages confidence in this House and in these institutions. In relation to education, and the guidance surrounding education. And, and there's big, big concerns. And I know many MLAs will have heard from their schools and their re re relevant constituencies uh, about the lack of guidance in relation to the reopening of schools that ensures or gives confidence to principals, teachers, parents, people that work in the school environment, that we can reopen schools and ensure the safety, the health and safety of uh, those in the wider school environment. But when guidance and regulation has been drip-fed through the BBC, it also damages the confidence in this House and in the executive. It is not acceptable that principals and teachers are hearing about what is expected of them when they are expected to ensure the health and safety of children. They are going to be the first exposed to large groupings of young people in schools, in small classrooms, and even with one metre in place, which I welcome, even with that in place, there are still, still significant risks because our schools will be expected to reopen. There's no extra money for the budget. There's no money in place to protect staff or ensure the safety and health of our children and young people. And that's the point that I'm making overall, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. For us and for the public to have confidence in this place, in our executive and in us as legislators, if we're going to make an announcement and continue making them to ensure that our society can re unlock itself and emerge from this safely and to prevent a reoccurrence or a spike of this uh, infection, we need to provide all the details clearly and remove any ambiguity around what is expected of the guidelines. And I'll finish on a final point. It becomes very, very frustrating for me each and every day to take calls from the public and not be able to clarify uh, their, uh, their concern or their question because they haven't or we haven't received the information that is necessary to do so. But if we're, if we're serious about ensuring confidence in this House, in this Assembly, particularly when people's lives are at stake, then let's get the finer details, the most simplest of things right, at least. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I apologise. I thought my name was on the list from earlier, but I, I really appreciate you allowing me coming in now. Um, I'm going to follow on from Mr. McCrossan's contribution today when he mentioned about the lucky dip approach to how um, different aspects of relaxing lockdown are coming forward. I'm not going to take too long today on this, but what I would ask is that the executive and the ministers absolutely consider putting the people back to the forefront of our lockdown uh, relaxations. Um, like many of you in this room, I am inundated on a day-in, day-out basis by the number of carers who are at breaking point across our society. 
They have no respite care. They have no day centres. They have no breaks. They are depending on food parcels, and for those who don't have a shielding letter from a GP, they finished last week. We have a community out there that are looking to us to show leadership. We have a community out there who need our help. We have a community out there who are still scared. And as my colleague Paula Bradshaw said very clearly, that when the easements come forward, that they must come with robust guidelines. We still need to help people to understand how to look after themselves, when the footsteps are going forward to lead them back into normal society again. When will they get the guidance that says, as a carer, thank you very much for the last 12, 13 weeks of you looking after, this could be a person in their 80s looking after their disabled adult son or daughter. Thank you for doing that. We know you've been on your own. You've been stuck in the house with that person. You've done everything where normally you could have got a bit of respite. Have we anything that's going to come forward for guidance for those people that says, okay, we're going to help now. The state is going to help you again. And I honestly will say, I know we have five and six today, and the, the parts of the legislation eight and nine are planned for the future. Can we please bring people back to the focus? Carers do not understand why a hotel, a pub, and a hairdresser is more important than they are. And while I appreciate we need to get our economy back up and running, can you imagine the cost it will be to each and every person across Northern Ireland if our carers collapse? Because when those people go, our health service will completely collapse. And I'm making a call out today to please provide robust guidance from health, from communities, from whatever department it needs to come from, to help those carers understand that they have not been forgotten about, that we know that they have worked so hard, so hard over the last number of weeks, on their own, without the support mechanisms that would normally be in place. Constituents need to know what the changes mean. There has been, up until very recently, when you click into the health coronavirus um, legislation, there was a document that spelt out for you exactly what that meant, what businesses were open and what it meant for individuals. That wasn't updated. It hasn't been updated since the 12th of June. Can we please do that? Because that was a useful document to be able to share with people. But we have nothing to give them now, as has been highlighted by others. It's time that we put people back to the front and we started to look after our society so that their mental health is not in such a terrible situation or a terrible way whenever they come out of this that they can't cope. Thank you. I now call on the junior minister, Gordon Lyons, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I welcome today's debate and thank members for their contributions uh, that, they, that they have made. Uh, I will turn directly to the um, points that some members have made during the debate today, and I will try to focus uh, on the questions that they have asked and the clarifications that they uh, have sought first and foremost. I begin with the Chairman of the Executive Office Committee, and the member has suggested that uh, early referral to the Ad Hoc Committee would be useful to provide scrutiny uh, and clarification. I am certainly more than happy to take that back to executive colleagues, but I would again remind him uh, that we are under a duty to terminate these regulations uh, as soon as we believe that they are no longer required in order to protect public health. And additionally, I would say as well that we are, a lot of the time we are making announcements, we are giving indicative dates, so there is hopefully that time for, for people to plan uh, and prepare as well. Mr. Uh, Gildernew then was next, and uh, he made a number of comments, but he will be pleased to hear that the Health Minister, um, since he was speaking, has now confirmed that there will be changes made in relation to hospital visits, visits in care home settings, uh, for scans um, for uh, pregnant women and their partners being able to attend as well, as well as now being able to attend um, the births uh, of, of their fathers are able to uh, attend the births of their children. I know this was a, a hugely uh, important issue, and I was delighted to be able to um, send a message to one of my constituents who had got in contact with me and asked me to lobby this on his behalf. And he said he was absolutely delighted. And um, he and his partner had, had broke down into tears because it was such an important thing uh, for them to be able to do. And he was delighted that I was able to share that good news with them. So I look forward to baby Gordon uh, coming along uh, in. Uh, in a, few, in a few weeks' time, and uh, maybe, maybe they'll take that as a suggestion uh, on board. 
I um, want to turn then to the, the remarks by uh, Pam Cameron. I want to welcome her support for the changes that allow a return to family life, and I certainly agree with her um, that the, the mental health and wellbeing benefits that result uh, from that uh, are vital. And I will touch on, on Kelly Armstrong's comments towards the end, um, but she, she did mention that we need to put people first. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would contend that we have put people first throughout um, this pandemic. We have been concerned first and foremost uh, about their health and their well-being. We have been concerned about their jobs and their economic prosperity. We have been concerned about their mental health. We have been concerned about how they are able to interact with their family uh, and their friends and all of the other societal issues that come as well. I accept the points that she has made in relation to carers, uh, but it is certainly the case that we have put people first and foremost uh, in all that we have done. I would also echo uh, Mrs Cameron's uh, support for the restoration of the economy and for the effective partnership working with businesses, trade unions uh, and councils, which is of course essential uh, for our communities uh, and for our high streets uh, as well. Uh, Ms Bradshaw, who is uh, still in her place, uh, acknowledged, um, or I want to acknowledge her concern again uh, about scrutiny in relation to these issues. It is the nature of the regulation that we have brought through, that it is up to the Minister of Health to terminate these whenever that is necessary. I hope these debates have been useful uh, in order for members to raise additional concerns. Um, we have tried to, to bring them as close as possible to the time when they are introduced, but I can understand the points um, that she has made and will, of course, take back the, uh, her agreement with the suggestion of Mr McGrath that we look into how the ad hoc committee can be used better uh, in relation to communicating um, changes and guidance with, with the Assembly uh, as well. In terms of risks uh, that she would mentioned, especially in relation to indoor uh, activities, I want to assure the member that every um, decision that is taken by the executive uh, takes account the professional medical and scientific advice of the CMO uh, and, the, and the CSA, and that there are risk assessments done. We do not just, as some members have said, um, pick ideas out of a hat or, or pursue our own narrow interests. We take all of these um, in a very collective uh, approach. Um, I welcome um, Mr Chambers' acknowledgement of our uh, relative success in the tackling of the pandemic. Um, I don't think it's time or appropriate for, for a victory lap for anybody uh, right now at this time. Obviously, I'm sure the member uh, would agree. Um, however, I, I think that the uh, successes that we have had, uh, and I agree with him on this, they're down to the actions and the responsibility of the people of Northern Ireland. And it's absolutely right that we put that on the record. And again, thank those in our health and social care sector that have done so much to protect us uh, and the ones that, that we love. And uh, he's absolutely right um, that it continues to be the case that citizen behaviour is what is key uh, in all of this. As I said in my remarks earlier, it's not just uh, about how we can uh, enforce these regulations. We're entering into a social contract with people, and they need to ensure um, that they are, are following to the, the, the letter and the spirit uh, of the law uh, as well. Can I also thank Mr Chambers for the very eloquent way uh, in which he spoke um, about the, the widow that he had mentioned? Uh, and the very, very sad circumstances um, surrounding uh, that funeral. And as I acknowledged in my earlier comments, this has been uh, a very, very difficult time uh, for people who have lost uh, a loved one. And we have to thank the, those that went through that difficult time and still adhered uh, to, to the regulations. And Mr O'Toole also mentioned um, the scrutiny. It was a, a common theme um, through this uh, debate, and we will certainly do all that um, we can to allow members to have that, that proper uh, scrutiny. He did, however, mention the timing of the opening of the pubs and believed that Friday evening in the middle of summer was a, was a bad time uh, to open those pubs. I dare say if any, any time of the week, perhaps, we could have, we could have had, had criticism for, for doing that. But it is important to note we did work with the sector. We talked to the sector in relation to these issues. Uh, it's also important to, to note that we did give a lead-in time uh, in order to help those um, uh, bars and restaurants prepare. And I would also note that we're not just opening pubs for um, alcohol sales only. This will help to bring this in in a managed way because people have to come in, probably in most cases book a table, sit down. There's not going to be a lot of milling around. It shouldn't be the case. Um, that these um, places are, are overcrowded. And I, would, I would also make the point as well that there is no requirement on anybody to open. And if people feel they need more time or would like to wait a few days, that is up to them. They, they have that choice and the ability to do that. I'm not
just ask, would he agree with me, though, with the principle, and you don't have to work behind a bar, to agree with the, the, the idea that a summer Friday afternoon, you are, there are more likely to be crowds attending pubs anywhere, just as a matter of arith arithmetic, because it's a Friday afternoon, people aren't working the, the next day, and that there's a reason why, for example, the south of Ireland and Scotland have chosen to open licensed premises on a Monday. Would he agree with me that there are, it would be, in that sense, safer in terms of managing crowds to open on a Monday? I understand the point that the member is making, however, I think I would come back to him and say that we're living in a very different time. Um, perhaps a lot of people um, aren't in that place where they want to be going out yet. Uh, I'm not sure how much different it's going to be. I think there could also be a, a rush for a lot of people who are eager to see them open, whether it would have been on a Monday or a Friday, would have, would have still wanted to have gone um, uh, and straight and, and, and booked their table or, or whatever else. But this, is, this isn't just opening up the doors and seeing who's coming in. There is, the, in most places, there will probably be a requirement to book a table beforehand because of the, of the nature of the restrictions that are going to be in place in terms of social distancing, uh, etc. But the, the, the member has, has made his point uh, and put it on the record. Um, Ms Woods uh, is absolutely right to say that the recovery plan is not uh, linear and we never said um, that it was going to be. This was always going to be our approach um, that we took to decision making uh, in relation to opening up um, parts of our um, uh, economy again. And um, the proposals are considered by the whole executive and we take um, all of the medical and scientific advice uh, into account. Remember, we are required to lift these restrictions uh, as soon as we don't believe that it's necessary to do so. And that means, in some cases, we've been able to move farther on in the regulations uh, than in others. That's why, in the, in the plan, sometimes we were at step four, or step one haven't been uh, completed. That, that's natural, and I think that it, is, it was wise for us to have uh, an, an agile plan so that we don't have to rush things forward sooner than they needed to be. Um, or we're not waiting then on the, on, on the slowest part uh, before we could open, open other areas up. And I noticed that she's raised specific concerns about guidance for pubs, and uh, I'm more than happy to draw her concerns in relation to that to the Economy Minister, who I am sure will uh, consider them uh, carefully. Um, I want to come on um, also to her comment in relation to uh, enforcement and the issues around the, the protests in particular. And I'll also touch on Mr. Carl's comments whenever I, I address her uh, remarks. Although we have been over this the last time um, that we were in the chamber for this matter, and there continues to be an insinuation that in some way ministers or officials uh, within the Department for Health uh, in some way were trying to pull a fast one uh, and bring this um, legislation in in order to specifically target um, Black Lives Matter, and I see that Mr. Mr. Card is agreeing um, with, with what I'm saying uh, in relation to that. So let me make it clear once more and to put on the record uh, that a drafting error in um, the Amendment No. 3 regulations, which came into operation at 11pm on the 19th of May, meant that it was not an offence to breach the new restriction in Regulation 6A relating to outdoor gatherings of up to six people. Regulation 6A was intended to be a concession in respect of families and friends who do not live in the same household to enable a small group of up to six friends or family to meet outdoors in places such as a private garden or public park. Regulation 6, which relates solely to a gathering in a public place of more than two people, has never been repealed and applied from the outset and accordingly, there has been no interruption to the enforcement powers relating to public gatherings under Regulation 6. The omission regarding Regulation 6A was noticed and corrected on the same day by way of an urgent technical amendment included in the Amendment No. 5 regulations, which came into operation at 11 p.m. on the 5th of June. The Amendment No. 5 regulations were being made that day following executive decisions to allow the lifting of some restrictions relating to outdoor marriages and civil partnerships, animal welfare, holiday accommodation and certain types of retail and wholesale premises from the 6th of June. The PSNI and Department of Justice colleagues were advised of the position on the same morning that the error came to light and were further advised that the error would be addressed by way of an amendment to the regulations to be commenced later that day. And I understand that no fixed penalty notices were issued by the PSNI for a breach of the restriction in Regulation 6A during the period in question. The Department of Health was simply using the opportunity of the Amendment No. 5 regulations to make a technical correction to a previous drafting error that had come to light that day. 
The timing of the Black Lives Matter protests on the 6th of June was purely coincidental, and the operational enforcement of the regulations is a matter for the PSNI. It's the second time that I've explained that to the member and to the House. I think he is still of the opinion um, that he, he does not accept uh, um, what, what, I, what I am saying. He says not just him, others uh, as well. In fact, I think he said earlier on in the debate um, that no anti-racist uh, would believe um, what we are saying uh, in, in, in relation to this, and I can say that that is certainly uh, not the case. Whether he or others choose to accept this is up to themselves, uh, but that is certainly the position of the Executive and of the Department of Health, uh, and I have read that now into the record. I want to uh, come on next to the comments um, of, of, of Mr Alistair. And I already said in my opening comments, and I've said also to Mr Chambers as well, that there have been an awful lot of people in our country who have had to forego the normal, traditional funeral arrangements that is a normal part of the grieving process here in Northern Ireland. Mr McCrossan also mentioned uh, his, his party colleague, the very uh, sad death of Mr Dallet, and their inability to attend uh, the funeral uh, as well. And I said when I was in the chamber earlier on that I hadn't seen the footage. Uh, I now have. Uh, I agree with the Minister of Health that there appears to be a clear breach uh, of the regulations. The, the regulations are very, very clear, and that's what we're here to talk about today, um, that only 30 people uh, are allowed to uh, attend an outdoor gathering related uh, to, to a funeral. Uh, so there was a... a I will give way here. Uh, well, well, the minister, is the Minister now advising people that under no circumstances should they line the streets when a funeral is taking place? That under no circumstances should neighbours come out and stand on the streets as a cortege passes? Under no circumstances can anyone pay their respects from the roadside? Because that really appears to be saying. Well, I'll, I'll say to Mr Dowd that that's not what I am saying. Um, I understand that many people have taken part in, in lining, uh, standing outside their houses or standing on, on a roadside. That's not what I am referring to here today in terms of the numbers that, that I saw. I don't want to go into uh, the detail. He's on record as saying a breach has taken place, which is quite a serious accusation. So he's going to have to stand over it. Where did the breach take place? I'm repeating what the Minister of Health said, that there appears to be a clear breach of the regulations. It's also clear that when people are moving, when there's a cortege, this is talking about any event, that that is limited to 30 people. I don't believe that that was the case today. And I think that that's exceptionally worrying for people who have been able, to, who have had to forego uh, a funeral. I think it's very unfair. And I think if you were to ask people today what they thought they would accept, that that was very, that's very unfair. It's, it appears that some people are allowed uh, to, to do one thing, but others uh, have to do uh, another. And so, look, I, I, I recognise that the police have already said that they are now reviewing um, the footage of this, and it, it, is their, it is their responsibility. But the point that I want to make is that it is exceptionally important that we not only follow the, the regulations that are set down, but that we also adhere to social distancing as well. Social distancing may not be written down uh, within um, the, the regulations, but it is a key part of what we need to do in order to ensure that we control this virus. Because as, as I said before, I do not want us getting into the position that Leicester finds itself in. I think it would be a terrible tragedy for our economy if we had to go back to the place uh, of locking, uh, locking things up again. Uh, and I think that that would be wrong, uh, and that's not where I want to be. So I would, I would appeal to people, whether it is young people taking part in gatherings, whether it is, is people in, in taking part in funerals, uh, whether it is any other sort of gathering, please adhere to the regulations, and please adhere to social distancing. We are trying to combat a disease here. Uh, and, and we need everybody's help and, and assistance uh, in that. I want to mention another issue that Mr Alistair raised, and it was in relation to, to marriages um, indoors. And the limit of 30 applies to indoor weddings uh, for people who are terminally ill. Um, the only circumstance in which indoor weddings uh, are permitted at present. And I, I will say I understand the concerns that Mr Alistair has raised and the inconsistency 
which he has raised in relation uh, to weddings. The executive have committed to looking at this again, um, uh, at this issue. There are some other um, consequences that we need to think of, for example, weddings that take place outside of church settings, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in private hotels or whatever else uh, it may be. Um, but we will, like all in indoor events, uh, uh, keep that uh, under, under review. Uh, Daniel McCrossan. Uh, yes. Yeah. Just on that, uh, the, on the issue of marriage, where the church is not opened up now for um, people to meet, as, as Mr. Alistair said earlier, and you see you're keeping this under review. When will the executive actually look at this particular issue? I have a number of constituents who have got on to me. Uh, they have had to cancel or postpone their wedding. They're wondering now, has the executive actually forgotten about them? They're still looking to get married. They're wondering when they're going to get married. There's very little guidance for them, apart from, uh, as again, as has been said in this house, a fair weather wedding. Uh, that's simply not, not, not really good enough whenever we have moved on into seeking to get reopened and into a more normal type of society again. And albeit with all the restrictions in place that we have to keep in place, but surely whenever churches are able to be opened and they're able to be funerals held in them and, and different other aspects, surely to goodness we can get them opened up for these people who want to get married within a church setting and within a church building. Marriage is, is something that's between, we know what it is, uh, between a man and a woman, and the, the, it's, it's there, it's traditional. People want to hold on to it, they want to go and they want to get married, and they've been held back from doing this. And I think it's time that the executive did take and take this matter serious, to look at it, and uh, make, make a decision on it for people to be able to get married in their own church. Well, I thank uh, Mr Buchanan for, for his comments and uh, I completely agree. There's lots of young couples out there that are very keen to, to get married and want to get married in the churches and they look at the services now that are able to take place in churches. They look at funerals that are able to take place in churches and they say, well, why not us? Uh, why, why can we not um, ha have weddings? So I'm very sympathetic with the point that the minister or that the member has made. This is something that um, I trust executive colleagues will be able to, to look at in the, in, in the coming days. We just may need to look at the unintended consequences of that, uh, realising that weddings can take place in other areas and wanting to make sure um, that, there is, that there is equity in relation to that. But why, while we are on the subject of churches, I'd, I, it would be remiss of me not to place on record um, my thanks to the churches working group that have done fantastic work over the last number of days, uh, put together guidance. Um, I'm very pleased that we are able to move to that position now where churches are able to, to reopen with a great degree of freedom. Um, the executive has not placed onerous restrictions um, uh, on them. But again, I say it's as with churches, as with the rest of society, with this extra freedom uh, comes responsibility. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're responsible uh, in relation uh, to that. In regards then to um, Mr. McCrossan's comments, I think I have uh, dealt with most of them in my responses to um, other, other speakers. But I would again um, make clear that whenever the executive makes decisions in relation to the relaxation of restrictions, it's based on, on three very clear uh, criteria. It's the scientific, uh, scientific and medical advice um, that's available, the ability of the health service to cope, and the wider societal um, impacts um, that any restrictions could have on, on, a, on the economy on, and on families, uh, etc. And um, I certainly... Absolutely. Minister, I thank you for just uh, well, touching on those issues. My point is, is merely that I welcome the reopening of society. I just want the guidance to be crystal clear. Up until now, it's been as clear as mud, and I think that's the issue for our society. We need to be very clear about what these regulations mean as we ease this lockdown. Uh, and I would say to the member that it's been very easy for us to turn everything off and to, to flick the switch off. To open up has been a lot more difficult because we're opening, opening up in a very controlled way. We're opening up um, in, a, in a way that sometimes has additional restrictions. Can I say I completely understand the frustrations that the member feels um, whenever he doesn't have the answers to the questions that constituents bring. Um, with every set of relaxations that we have, it's very clear 
um, that there are always people that perhaps don't fit neatly into some of the categories that we have announced or, or other issues um, that, that they have for us. So I can understand that the frustration that the member has uh, in relation to that, but certainly you can get in contact with uh, the relevant department uh, and hopefully um, through the de departmental assembly liaison officer uh, and hopefully they will be able to provide that guidance uh, and that uh, additional uh, reassurance uh, to, to the member. I think I've already uh, touched on the, uh, on the comments um, by um, Kelly Armstrong, um, but I certainly br will bring uh, what uh, she has said to the attention um, of, of the Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, yes, why not? To, at the end, I waited until you got through everybody before raising this. At the beginning, you had mentioned about the suggestion that I had made about to come to the ad hoc, and there was just a bit in it that wasn't clear, and I wanted to, to clear that matter up. The idea would be that if you make announcements on a Thursday and a Monday, that the ad hoc committee would meet that Thursday after to clarify any questions that members have. It's not about agreeing to the changes, but it's the questions that you get. Because a number of members have mentioned that when a statement is made, there is a lack of clarity. We get bombarded with questions. And if we have to go through the departmental system, it can take weeks to get the answers back, which just adds to the confusion. But if the ministers were able to come on the Thursday after the announcements have been made, we would be able to seek that clarity and deliver it straight back, which would be a much better system. It's not about agreeing to the changes, which I think you'd mentioned at the beginning. No, I appreciate the comments that the member has, has made, and I, I will certainly take that to executive colleagues and um, seek their views on that and come back to, to the member. Um, it may not always be the case, though, that um, uh, the regulations fall exactly to one minister, um, but you know, the point remains that if there are issues of clarification, I would encourage uh, members to, to get in contact with us, but we'll also examine um, the other ways in which that can uh, take place, because I, I do believe um, that the Assembly needs to have its place, and the Assembly can be exceptionally useful as well in finding, um, uh, uh, making sure that we have the extra clarification that we need uh, in relation to, to some of these uh, issues. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think that I have um, uh, answered most of the questions and queries that people have. Um, if there's anything further um, that they wish for me to address, um, I'll be happy to um, take that from them uh, in writing and, and get back to them. Um, but in the meantime, I commend the regulations to the Assembly. <coughs> Members, the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Regulations Amendment No. 5, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. Aye. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We will now move on to the motion on the Health Protection Corona Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 6 regulations, which has already been debated. I now ask the clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 6 regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. And I would call the uh, junior minister to formally move the motion. I beg to move. <clears throat> These have already been debated, so I, the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 6 regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. I'd ask members to take their ease for a few moments. <clears throat> 